Right. So we are everyone. here to be excited about uh, the consistency issue. This one. Yes. That this everyone should have. Hopefully. Um, not yet. Not yet? Where not are yet. you? In Australia. Oh, wait. Who's talking? Where are you? Erica. Sorry, I can't get my video up. <clears throat> it's a little black square. <laughs> I only can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, good. I'm looking for you, but I don't see you. Um, yeah, it's just a black square that says Erica. Um, I tell you, I don't know what's going on with the postal service. From what I understand, um, from what I understand, <laughs> which <laughs> admittedly not much, but we as a nation, a USPS is not delivering to Australia right now. Uh, now yeah. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. So you can't send anything like first class or however, periodical postage, our periodicals are not sent uh, via USPS. So they are still getting there, but apparently yeah. Australia Post is also on a delay, so mm -hmm. they're country. They're just waiting for Australian Post to deliver them. Yeah, I, I understand that, and I'm very um, patient. So I've got my digital issues. So yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm I, I fully understand everything that's going on. So. I wish I wish I more fully understood it because <laughs> sometimes yeah. I get an issue like three weeks later than Julian. Um, mm. It really is, is a, and Australia, no, not Australia, can, Canada seems to be the hardest right now to get issues to. Um, Canada's yeah. always been hard. It's slow and expensive. Mm -hmm. And the border guards do not want you guys to get better at spinning. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a conspiracy. You yeah. guys. Um, so hi, how is everybody? Good. Low anxiety, total hmm. joyous life. <laughs> That's where we all are right now, right? It's fall in the U.S. The weather's changing, so that makes it all better for me. It makes me want to knit. It makes me want to spin. It's all good. I'm actually feeling hmm. a bit more like uh, energized, and I was having a, a weird and hard last few months. I mean, I think we all are, but health-wise, I was a little bit having a difficult time. Um, we're all women here, I will tell you. Are we? Is every... Um, so I was going, should, is this okay? Can I just tell you guys this? <laughs> Jillian is like, no, do not talk about your menopause. <laughs> we all, we all can talk about menopause, perimenopause, postmenopause. It's forever. So I apparently have full, full ovary failure. That's what I'm, so, um, so I've had like a rough couple months just trying to figure that out because nothing new. and also um, trying to get out of bed every day. But now um, uh, with some more hormones added to my body, I feel much, much better. You're always an overachiever, JC. You went from zero to 100 for menopause with no in between. <laughs> with no in between. Seriously. It's like, everything's great. And then the next day, JC doesn't get out of bed anymore. Um, but now you're better. But now you feel better. And, but not as good as Susan, who got to go to Rhinebeck yesterday. I am so jealous. I was looking on uh, Instagram at everybody's pictures. Rhinebeck was awesome. What did you buy? I always want to know that. What did I not buy is really <laughs> the question. I bought a bullseye bump from The Loop. Nice. My second one. Do people know what a bullseye bump is? That's Stephanie, right? At Loop? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I bought yeah. a bullseye bump. I bought a braid of what will be socks from Into the World. Mm. And the highlight of the whole thing was I got to meet Maurice Ribble. Oh. And I like bumped elbows with him. And 
it was really, and his wife, Emily was there and they're lovely, lovely people. And he is the rock star inventor of the electric eel wheel. Nice. And I just can't even believe that it happened. That's like the whole reason I went like to meet Maurice. That's and cool. Did they a- have a booth or were they just wandering? They had a whole booth. They had their own booth. And, and, and he demonstrated the, the yarn winder, the, the cone winder and the counter. And anyway, what a peach. That was really cool. In addition to all the shopping. It was my first time there. Oh, fine. So. Have you, Jillian, do you have one? Pardon? Uh, Jillian, do you have an eel? I do. I have the nano and I need to replace the tiniest one. Um, I need to replace the battery to from the, the motor to the stronger motor. I like it for time for doing tiny yarn. Like I spin yarn for stitching on it. And also it fits in my lap in the car to spin. But we should get wheels from him to review and to use in the magazine. I have still not spun on one. Uh, but I think I have most of the other electric wheels out there. But you know me, love electric wheels. You haven't, JC, you haven't tried the Nano or the Six? I have not spun on, no, I have not spun on any wheels by them at all. Someone who lives near JC, bring her one. Oh, we'll get one. We'll talk to Maurice. Um, That'll be good. All right. Are we ready to rock the issue? Yes. Okay. Open things up a little bit today. JC has made a bunch of videos. She had the greatest idea and um, to spin through the issue, to show techniques that were in the issue. Um, So that's coming up. But first, I'm going to do my bit first. Let me undo you. Share the screen. Oh, good. That came up because I was shopping earlier. I was hoping all my shopping, my yarn shopping, wasn't going to show up on the screen. Um, the first thing I want to do is thank the people who contributed, um, who contributed tools and fiber for the issue. Um, it's a, in a page in the magazine, but I always feel like I want to say their names out loud because we could not do it without them. Kamaj Fiber Arts, Acre Works, which they have I have so many tools and bobbins from them they just do a wonderful job and they just celebrated their 10th anniversary of being in business how adorable are they how cute is it? yes at Nancy's Knit Knacks Cynthia Wood Spinner uh, Levi apparently made a template is that true yes <laughs> I saw that and laughed um hip strings and I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. Milky Fiber Arts. Jenkins. We used a t- uh, Turkish spindle. Evanita, right? Used a Turkish spindle. She has quite a collection of Jenkins spindles. And fibers. We use Brookmore Creations. Middlebrook Fiber Works. Essential Fiber. And then we used um, Deadless Wheels. Sparrow and the Magpie, uh, Hansen Mini Spinner, the Pro, Amaja Craft Rose, a Lendrum, uh, two different Luets, and an Ashford Wee Peggy. Do they still even make those? I don't think they do, but this person had one. No. Hey, I want to throw this out real quick. Um, Nancy's Knit Knacks, I'm pretty sure, uh, I'm pretty sure that that company got bought is one of the companies that Strauss bought. Yes. Um, after, after Otto and Joanna left. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, as far as I know, that is now defunct Strauss, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate. I mean, in general, because Strauss is, was one of my favorite companies, but also uh, they bought several smaller companies, which I think now are all, that. And Nancy's Knit Knacks with that kind of fancy um, Lazy Kate. Yes, the big, the big, huge Lazy Kate. Yeah, is now, I don't think you can get. I have hope that someone's going to pick up all of those companies. 
too. So many people interested in being part of the fiber world who are so talented yes. that I think somebody's going to grab it. Um, and Laura, our uh, concierge for shopping, tells us that AcreWorks is having a sale right now, 10% off, with the code 10 more years for their anniversary. Nice. And Strauch has been bought by someone. Oh, yes. We'll figure that out. That is true, but are you talking about Mike? I don't know. Uh, who is, who's is it Joan? Is it Mike? And then Corey after that. Yeah, yeah. I, I spoke with him. I actually shipped him my uh, ball winder, and he fixed it, and he sent it back to me. Um, when was that? Um, oh, about three months ago. Okay, so it has closed since then. Oh, it has. So Mike bought it. For those of you that don't know, Mike, who is really great, bought it and unfortunately lost. And his friend Corey took it over and was really trying to like make a go of it. Um, but I think it just, all of that happened together. I think it just got the better of them. Mm. And I'm pretty sure they've closed their doors for good, or at least mm. that that rendition that um of Strauss. So we're still healthy or hoping we'll figure it out. Something else happens. Yeah. Right now. Um I also wanted to thank someone in particular. Sorry, I was, I was having a problem with the phone. Um Karen. I I hope this doesn't embarrass you. I spotlighted you, but we're talking about consistency and there's, um, he's got their mic on. Got tightness in his chest, got pins and needles in his arms, so they're going to check him out. Oh, wow. I'll keep, yeah, I'll keep you posted and let you know what's happening. Okay. I don't know who it is. Can everybody turn their mics off? Um, yeah. So, what, like he was having like an epileptic fit? Yeah, like he, I don't know, like he, that's why he described it. It looked like he had to put his arms and stuff were going on. And it's like, you like talking to him, like, there it is. Thing. All right, shoo. Can I have somebody talking in the background when we make Karen blush? <laughs> Karen, this is Karen Robinson. She is our, what's your official title? Managing editor slash copy editor. Yes. But <laughs> if, you, if you want to talk about consistency, she is the reason our magazine exists. She is the reason our magazine is consistent. If it wasn't for Karen, we wouldn't get the magazine out. And it certainly wouldn't be as organized and as wonderful as it is. So, Karen, I would like to give you an extra thank you in our uh and our, for our consistency issue and for all of the issues, because we couldn't do it without you. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's great to um, to have a job that doesn't necessarily feel like a job. You know, it's it's yes, there there's hard parts, but um, but it's fun to be able to put everything together and to work on it. You're well, awesome. I, yes, and I I always appreciate you, but especially these last few months, I feel like everything would have fallen apart if you had not on the down low kept it all together. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yay. All right, back to this. I'm just gonna talk quickly about the a few of my favorite things in here and then JC is gonna show us her videos. <laughs> Got to talk about Sarah Sweat. Always talk about Sarah Sweat. She seems to be stepping back a little more. I know she's had some physical issues, um, but her article about showing up no matter where your curiosity leads you really spoke to me because I'm one of those people that doesn't necessarily go in a straight line. And sometimes I feel, you know, like I'm here, there, things are shiny, but it always ends up on one path. And uh, she talks about that exact same thing with spinning and weaving her tapestries. And she is just amazing and articulate and funny. 
And I can't get enough of her. I wish she would write for us every issue. <laughs> and then this is just one piece of it. Um, the whole series by Marceline Smith really blew my mind. I um, approached her and Anna Troy to, to write a series for this issue. And it came out more wonderful than I could have imagined. Um, she used Anna's fiber to spin yarn, which then she naturally dyed, and then she knit into these mitts that she called land to hand mitts. And not only is she talented, again, she is a wonderful writer. And the way that she approaches spinning and all craft just really always touches me. Then I have to talk about my article because I try hard to, <laughs> to talk about myself. It's hard. Um, but, but this, I felt, was really important to get out there. Consistency for, and I say it in the article, for a lot of people is, is about perfection. And I see too many spinners, uh, women especially, beating themselves up because they are not consistent enough or perfect enough. And I think it has nothing to do with that. It is an absolute consistency is a personal thing. It's a process. And, um, and, and it's not something that you should ever feel bad about not being consistent enough. Uh, consistency is 100% about what you are doing and the yarn that you love to make. So that's me. We like you. Thanks. <laughs> so now, JC, your turn. Okay, so let me preface this <laughs> by saying- Tell us a story, JC. <laughs> I'm not a professional video maker. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like if you watch these videos, you wouldn't even know I'm a professional spinner, but you guys are the only ones that are ever gonna see it, right? And everyone on YouTube. Okay, um, first, uh, before I show you this, I want to show you guys what I, instead of doing this, uh, instead of doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing, which is um, making these videos and why they're a little more rushed than they would have been, is because yesterday, what I actually spent time doing, let me find it, is, can't I make it go where I want it to go? There is making this, hang on, which is a Halloween. Um, I, I have to figure out how to do this. I asked Jillian today if it's always like this for people, how do I make it more seamless? But um, so I know she says it's like this for everyone. Everyone, so, everyone's always looking. Can you guys see? my screen yet? Yes, we see your desktop. This is what I made, which is creepy my, baby dolls. <laughs> my Halloween display, which is a little funeral procession of dolls coming out of our house, carrying a wrapped up something. <laughs> Sounds creepier than it is. Um, so far, I have observed personally six people take a picture of it. Nice feel pretty, pretty good about my, my creative endeavors. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you these videos, but I'm going to confuse everyone first. Uh, stop share. Let me talk to you for a sec. Okay. The videos, what I thought would be a great idea is um, to kind of pick some articles through the issue in an ongoing way where I spin or uh, Jillian spins, someone spins the actual technique on the video um, that goes with the article, mostly because spinning is one of those things that it's, I think we do a really good job with photos, but sometimes seeing it uh, is easier to digest what it means um, and how to do it. So I did a quick video this morning uh, before we attempted to watch the Chiefs game and uh, Levi shot it and my cats interacted with it and 
you know, it's medium, it's medium quality, but let's see how it goes. So let's go to share screen. And I think this one and present. Okay. JC spins through consistency. Okay, so the first one I want to do is Yarn Forensics by Michelle Boyd. Uh, I thought this was a great article. It essentially kind of diagnoses uh, your issues with your yarn and then talks about how to fix them. So here's a little video where I talk about it. So this article is by Michelle Boyd called Yarn Forensics. Essentially, she is talking about diagnosing the yarn that you spun, like what's wrong with it and how to fix it. So the first thing that she talks about is slubs and then coils, twists, corkscrews, uh, and then she does a little thing about plying problems. We're gonna start with slubs and here we go. So when you were spinning, I'm sure you've had slubs. It's a little thick spot uh, or a big thought spot in your yarn. So the first thing she talks about in getting slubs is if you let twists sneak into your fiber supply. So take a look at this being the yarn, the make, and this being my fiber supply. So watch as I, as I draft. If I draft here, there's no twist slipping here. If I lighten my twist pinch just a little bit, I get a little twist slipping in. And then if I draft, I generally will get a thick spot. Let me turn this around because it is going the wrong direction here. All right, so drafting, 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 letting a little twist through, pulling forward. It's not happening. Let me turn my uptake down. <laughs> All right, so drafting, little twist through. Ooh, that's too much uptake. There was no editing. All right, drafting, little twist through, still drafting, thick spot. Ha. Ah. I successfully created a slub. <laughs> okay, again, drafting, drafting, let a little twist through, draft again, thick spot. So if you just don't do that, <laughs> it'll decrease your slubs. So essentially draft, don't let twist through. Um, if you find that you have to really pinch these fingers to keep twists from going through, uh, you're not gonna enjoy the spinning neither are your fingers. So instead decrease your uptake just a hair so that you don't have to pinch quite so hard. Uh, the more uptake you have, the more the wheel pulls the yarn that way, uh, which allows a little bit of twist to get through your fingers. So decrease your uptake and you won't have to pinch quite so hard. You should be able to draft with like, let it go and the twist still doesn't get through. That's how much uptake you don't wanna have. So again, don't allow twist in and you won't get that type of slub. The second thing she talks about that causes slubs is varying your drafting length. So we talk a lot about knowing your fiber length and not drafting more than two thirds of that length with each draft. Um, it really helps to get an even yarn if you pick a drafting length and most spinners do this by habit, but pick a drafting length and stick with that length. So say this right here is my drafting length. This is how I'm doing it. Now, if I vary that, I pull out too far, I pull out just a little bit, I pull out too far, maybe I just pull three quarters of the way out. I end up with, even if I try to get it even, I end up with kind of a slubby yarn. And that might be hard to see when I just hold it out, but if I do a ply back, you can see how I have some pretty distinct slubs. So that is the second thing she talks about is keeping your, your drafting length the same as much as you can. The third thing that causes slubs is pinching and unpinching as you draft. So this right here, even if I shorten my drafting, and I do it, I'm still getting these little slubs because the part I'm not pinching on is ends up really lofty and poofy, a little more woolen, if you will. The part I am pinching on ends up more compressed. So if I'm pinching and unpinching, it's really hard to not get slubs. Again, you can see those slubs 
well, I think it was, that didn't really show it to you. Um, <laughs> but you can see how it's slubby here, it gets thinner here. Um, so that is varying. No, that's not varying, that's pinching and unpinching while drafting. The next thing she talks about is drafting longer than the staple length, which, let's tear that off since it's already divided, which is if my staple length is this long, I don't wanna draft this long or this long or this long. I wanna draft here, like three quarters of the staple length. So if I do that, then my state, then I'm pretty even. If I draft longer than that, I get thin spot, thick spot, which is a way to spin thick and thin in a regular kind of consistent manner, which we'll talk about in a minute. But spinning longer than your drafting, drafting longer than your staple length will give you slubs. If it's too late, like if you've already made a slub, and you're like, oh, I don't want this in my yarn, you can kind of double draft it, which just tw untwist it a little bit and kind of draft between your two fingers until, or your two hands until you're happy with kind of getting that slub out. So there we go. You can also, if it's too bad, like if you've got one and you've gone past it and you're just like, ah, oh, I can't get this out, I'm trying and it won't come undone. Um, Michelle recommends that you just take it in front of it, break it off, and ooh, start again in front of where your slub was. So rejoin, pull forward for your join, and then keep going. So that is slubs. She also talks about uh, coils, kinks, and corkscrews, and you guys all know what those are. Uh, the main reason they're caused is that we are twisting, we're adding twist to our yarn faster than we draft. So if I'm drafting slowly, if I'm working on my drafting or I'm nervous or it's a new fiber, my feet might be going faster and my hands might be really trying to focus. And so I end up with these, see this right here? Corkscrews, twists, kinks, all those things, which essentially kind of mean the same thing. So what you wanna do is if you can, slow down your feet. Speed up your hands, pick, or pick a bigger pulley on your wheel. So right now, well, I'm on the biggest one, but if I was on the smaller one, say here, and spinning, and I was, let's go a little thicker, and I was getting uh, too much twist, and you can see that this is starting to like kink up right there, then if I don't change anything else except for the pulley, Keep the pulley, I didn't. And I keep spinning, treadling faster. I'm going to at least decrease the kinks and coils. Uh, if I had a bigger pulley, I could switch to that. The bigger pulley, the lower uh, and slower you're going to insert twist. You can also slow down your feet, which I understand is sometimes difficult. But slowing down your feet, moving your hands faster, all of those things will decrease the coils, kinks, and corkscrews. Okay, hang on. There's another thing. So this article Not that is, one. Ready? Yep. The final thing Michelle talks about is plying problems. And so we're gonna go through these real quick. The first thing she says causes plying problems is changing your plying length, which essentially means I'm plying along and I push, this is my plying length right here. So changing my plying length would mean that sometimes I come to here, sometimes I come to here, sometimes I come to here, and this changing it ends up with a really kind of irregular ply. The second thing she talks about is not not enough plying uptake. So if I have my, ply, my, my uptake really low and I'm trying to ply, no matter what, even if it's, if I am plying evenly and it's not pulling in, I'm gonna get really over plied. So let's turn it up just a little bit. And 
essentially you want enough uptake that it takes the yarn, it being the wheel. The wheel takes the yarn when you give it to it, but it doesn't pull it out of your hands. Uh, conversely, if you have too much plying uptake, then, well, if it goes at all, <laughs> that might be too much, um, it's going to pull it out of your hands before you get it plied well or enough ply twists. So you end up with something that looks more like this, kind of loosey-goosey. And finally, and this is one that I see a lot, uh, uneven tension on your plies. So if you kind of ply like this, <laughs> you're gonna end up with a yarn unevenly tensioned, inconsistent. If you even ply with your hands here, and one of them out here, like with your finger out here, you want to wrap around the other one. Ideally, you want your yarns to, and I separate with my finger to do this, to be hitting the plying twist point at the same angle. So, sliding your finger down, giving you a nice even ply, even though your yarns are uneven like mine. The plying is even. If I one goes out to the side at all, it ends up wrapped around. If this one goes out to the side, it ends up wrapped around. So you wanna keep them as even as you can. Here's some of that yarn where we were getting too much twist. Um, and you could pull that straight and kind of ply past it, but you're going to end up with an overplied part there because there was too much twist in the single. One way that you can combat that is to make sure it's kind of like let a longer section fly so that ply to twist redistributes, but you're still gonna get an uneven ply if your singles are uneven. So again, changing your plying lengths like this will give you a ply that changes, right? Not enough plying uptake will give you a really uneven kind of loosey goosey ply and generally a lot of like this kind of thing where you get a little coil in your ply. And finally, uneven tension is gonna give you this kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, don't do any of those things. Okay. <laughs> Um, the next one I did was my own article because I felt like I was qualified to do that uh, here. In the article that I wrote, which I think I'm qualified to spin for, <laughs> some of the other stuff is hard, um, but I talk about how to make your texture germs really consistent and even. Uh, one of the things that I talk about is the evenness of your singles when you then use those singles yarns to create a texture yarn during plying, uh, such as super coils. So if when you are spinning super coils, you want them to be even, then you need to spin your single, which is this yarn. Ooh, that happened, didn't it? Let's fix that. You wanna spin your single pretty even. This green yarn, by the way, is going to be the core that I wrap my super coils around. Let's get past this part. All right. So this yarn, as you can see, is, is pretty even. Um, however, I bet when I super coil it, it's, you're going to see how uneven it really is uh, because super coils tend to accentuate that. So I'm super coiling and pushing up. Super coiling, pushing up. Notice how... If I do it, there it goes. It's, it's pretty evenish, um, but still there's a little bit of undulation there. And that's just because my single is not perfectly even. I can kind of change that by super coiling at a more even rate because notice as I super coil, as I wind it on, twist comes out of this section. Um, so if I try to minimize that, then I can make it look a little more even, but really, ooh, that was really uneven. Really, the more even you can get your single, the more even your super coil is going to be. Uh, if it's very uneven, say like this one that I'm about to do, let me turn this tension up. Then your 
super coils are going to be very uneven, like so. All right, thick parts are going to be thicker, thin parts are going to be thinner. Now, if you want it to be uneven, but you want it to be like consistently uneven, you have to spin a single that's consistently uneven. And what I mean by that is that the, the thick parts maybe are the same thickness or the thin parts are the same thickness or the distance between the two is the same. Um, so say you spin a thick and thin where the thick parts are essentially the same thickness and the same distance apart, then you're gonna get a super coil that looks consistently inconsistent. So that's what this would be. So notice that I get almost looks like a string of pearls because thick, thin, thick, thin. So there is a consistently inconsistent uh, super coil. Ah, come on, where is it? And there we go, next one. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, restart that. That's how most of my takes were. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, another one starts the same. Go to the next one. Sure, is using uh, your staple length to keep your yarn consistent. One example is in a thick and thin. In a thick and thin yarn, let's find this is a long staple length. So I want my thick part to be shorter than my staple length. So if I make a thick spot here, this is quite long. My staple length is about this long. My thick spot's about this long. The ends of my thick spot are trapped in this high twist section. Now, if I switch to a shorter staple length fiber, then I need to keep that in mind when I make my thick spot because it should be thin, shorter than the other one. <laughs> but the thick spot, again, is shorter than my staple length, which is about right here. So let's take a look. Let's compare these two thick spots. So the brown one was from a long fiber. The kind of pinkish purple one is from a shorter fiber. Each of them, the thick spots are shorter than the staple length. So it helps to know your staple length uh, to make consistent textured yarns. All right, let's see what else. Sure, is using... All right, I think this is the last one in my article. Another example of keeping things where you want them is coils. So if you are coiling, you have to anchor your coil at the beginning and at the end. In this case, I'm going to use this, this uh, commercially spun yarn, which is going to be my core and my anchor. So at the top, all I have to do is instead of plying these evenly, I'm going to bring my core yarn to the side, wrap it around like two times, switch tension, and wind on my coil. When I push it up, I'm going to do the same thing again right there, and this will keep my coil from moving around. Again, let's do that. And I've got a little fight. I've got a little uh, twist build up here, but anchor, right? I just rolled it, wind it on, push it up, and then anchor again by pulling this out to the side. We're gonna do it one more time. Anchor, wind on, push up. See how I cannot push it up any farther? Anchor again and bring them together. Uh, I wouldn't normally use, say, pink with a green thread, but I wanted you guys to really be able to see it. Now, if I don't anchor it, it looks like this. I wind it on, I push it up, I keep going, and then my coil slides around. So part of being consistent or tidy in textured yarns is keeping stuff where you want it to be. All righty, just one sec. Let me look real quick and see what the next one is before I show you guys if I... <laughs> Another example. Oh, the X one's okay. I'm going to share it too. Um, <laughs> I'm going to spin coils tonight. <laughs> okay. um, what I have realized in doing these is that I have spent all of COVID not really talking out loud about spinning. And 
it goes away. Not the, not the ability to spin, but usually or used to the words about spinning and descriptions about spinning would just kind of like fall out of my mouth. Like I, I just knew them, right? It was almost like it was scripted because I said them so many times, but because I haven't done that at all, talking about spinning is, was almost awkward. We had to shoot the thing over and over again, also because I don't know how to edit videos. So I had to get it in one take, <laughs> but, um, but I realized that I no longer have the kind of natural flow in general. And if this vlog may be an excellent example of that, I'm not sure I have that natural flow just talking to people about anything anymore, but talking to people about spinning, um, at least I always felt really comfortable like with that, like it was natural and it did not feel that way today. Um, but I'm gonna show you this last one. Uh, I'm gonna share. I'm going to share, share, there we go. Okay. So this one is, um, spinning blends by Jill and it's going to talk about spinning in series and spinning parallel, which I think are helpful for a lot of things that we do a lot of different kinds of spinning, even if it's not specifically blends. Um, but I thought it might be helpful for people that are unfamiliar what the terms mean in general to kind of see it in action. So here's a short little video about that. Okay. So this article by Jill Duarte is about spinning blends. Uh, the first thing she talks about is spinning in series. So if you have a blend or two fibers that are similar enough in crimp and length, you can spin them in series. So these two fibers are almost exactly the same in crimp and length, uh, but they are different colors. So if we wanted a striped yarn, then we could spin in series, which means here we go, spinning this yarn. Say we wanna make it striped, we can stop and spin this yarn. Ooh, that was ugly. Let's do that again. We spin this yarn. And essentially what this means, I mean, you could do this with any yarn really, but what it means when there's similar uh, crimp and staple length is that when you go to work this yarn up, the yarn itself is not going to change when it switches colors. So it'll work up the same way because they are both similar crimp and staple length. So you just switch back and forth, you spin these in series. If you want that to be true, the yarn doesn't change, but you have a fibers that are say similar staple length, but different in some other aspect and you wanna minimize that aspect. And that aspect can be say crimp or color or um, texture, but you wanna combine those two together like these two. Uh, they have the same staple length, but different crimp and different color. So we can spin those, what's called, in parallel. So we put them right next to each other and we spin them at the same time, like so. Now, if these were really different staple lengths, this would not be possible because one would pull out and leave the other behind. So we'd end up spinning only one with the other being left behind. So this is spinning uh, in parallel, again, together, parallel and switching back and forth is spinning in series. Uh, of course, if your fibers are too different or uh, you have a lot of different staple lengths or a lot of different textures and colors, uh, the other way to do it is to, of course, blend it by hand, like on a carter or combs, uh, and then spin that. That's an easier way to get everything blended together. Okay. <laughs> And the last one is very bad, okay. but I'm going to so show you anyway, because uh, keeping it real here on the ply wave law or the ply vlog. Are you ready? <laughs> this one is about control cards, but that's not what I covered. I covered something much harder. Uh, and the main thing I want to talk about <laughs> in the spinning part is doing a three ply ply back, uh, which Don't is try notoriously this difficult. In fact, I filmed this like six times already. Um, the reason you would do it is if you're making a three ply yarn for a project and you're spinning and you want to see what that three ply yarn is going to look like. You wouldn't necessarily use this three ply ply back 
as a control for the yarn, but more just to get a feel for if you're happy with how the yarn looks. So go ahead and spin your single like so. And when you're ready, instead of doing a two ply yarn ply back like that, you're going to do one, two times, pinch and give it a twist with your hands. If you don't give it a twist with your hands, it wants to just end up being kind of like this, but the whole way, which is a two ply with a third strand to the side. You don't want this to happen. You're looking for this right here. Let's let that go all the way. Once you release it, you should be able to see your three ply strand kind of in the middle. Sometimes I get these little tips on either side. Um, ideally, you'd like the whole thing done, but honestly, I have trouble getting that. See if I can do it one more time. Give it a twirl with your fingers and then let it go. There we go. You're still going to get this little but there's your three ply. And notice that I'm still getting this little, this little tail at the end where it's just a two ply, but that's okay because this is what I'm looking at to see if I like right there, my three ply. You don't use this as a gauge or a control for spinning. If you like it, take it out and then do it as a two ply like so. And this is going to be your control. So you're gonna tear this off put it next to your wheel somewhere and every once in a while check and see if this is how you're split spinning because this two ply ply back will give you the three ply that you liked. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> uh, and the main thing I want to talk okay. about. Okay. So here's what I, here's what I want to say about that. That was awesome. You can <laughs> totally see it. Okay. Also, the three ply, so hard to make a three ply back yarn. Um, really, really hard to make. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe I should not be the one demonstrating that. <laughs> um, I promise if we continue to do that based on your guys' feedback, I will make, actually, I would really like it to not, I didn't want to do videos. I wanted to do it live, but, um, I don't have the sweet setup like Jillian where you have, you can film over your head. Um, so I would just be doing it here and talking about it and you guys would be lost, more lost than you were watching my videos. I'll help you figure out a setup. That would be awesome. <laughs> but I think um, I think doing that three, three strand flyback sample is hard for everybody. So hard. Yeah. But, but, you, it, know, but you want, all you want is a peak. You just want to see a little bit. You just want to see if you're happy with it. Yeah. <laughs> so there is some of spinning through that issue. There was more spinning in it, but those were the things I thought uh, maybe could use a little bit of live demoing. I'll hire a professional next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to show you something. Let's see. What am I, I just want to interrupt for one second. You know, JC, you're you're spinning like a human, normal person, like Jillian said at the beginning. Everything doesn't have to be perfect. So actually watching you struggle was way better than having you be perfect. Oh, good. I don't know if anybody else feels that way. Give a thumbs up if you do. I, I just think that, that that's so much more useful to me. Um, just so much so much more useful to me to see that actual thing so don't hire a professional that's for like craftsy you know what i mean don't do that thank you sorry i i was thank you i agree i uh mostly it wasn't so much the spinning because i often mess up in spinning demos because we're human and we do that we mess up and sometimes we get it right and the worst part about being a spinning teacher is sometimes when you're trying to show the wrong thing to do and you can't get it it's like the thing that always happens, but you can't get the wrong thing to happen. Um, but yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, mostly I just thought my, my production value could have used some, and also just my speaking rhythm. Uh, I used to be more graceful speaking about spinning. But You're good. It was totally understandable. It was perfect. I want to go and run and try some things now. 
You're so positive and nice to me. But not right now. Right now, I'm going to talk about my favorite uh, consistency tools. Going to give a, a more shout out to Jill Duarte because it's hip spring, hip strings, um, twist angle gauge, and um, and yarn gauge. I use these constantly. I am a very lazy spinner. I want to do things the quickest and easiest way. Um, but I use these a lot and people often ask why, how, how to use it. I have some uh, yarn here, which also happens to be hip strings. I need to set it, but I haven't done that yet. It is um, Strawberry rhubarb is the colorway, and it's Polworth and silk and bamboo. It's uh, really a great blend, and I am not a fan of bamboo usually when I'm spinning. But to use a twist, uh, to use a yarn gauge, and they make several different kinds. This goes from six wraps per inch to forty wraps per inch, so it has like the whole, the whole run of sizes on it. This one I asked her to make and she started selling them for chubbier yarns because I don't tend to spin um, as fine as a lot of people. This one goes from two wraps per inch to 18 wraps per inch. And how I use it either with a singles or applied yarn is I put it underneath. A lot of people put it, put them on top, put their yarn on top and let it fall into the little bit of a divot. Um, I find myself misreading my wraps per inch when I do that. I put the my yarn behind, and that way I can see if it completes the line behind the um, behind the gauge. So this looks like fourteen wraps per inch for this one. That's very smart. I know, and if I had put it on top, I could have convinced myself that it was eighteen because it fit in the divot, but I'd be lying. And I lie to myself a lot when it comes to crafts. <laughs> well, <laughs> I know it's wish it's the wishful thinking. And I keep these hang. I hang these on my wheel or keep them right beside me on my wheel. And then twist angle gauge. I don't use as much. I use it forensically more than when I am spinning a yarn or plying a yarn. If something goes wrong with the yarn, then I get out all of the measuring tools. And um, these twist angle gauges, this is the one that they've had for a long time. And this is um, a broader one that's new and um, it doesn't go as twisty. It just goes to 45, 45 degrees. But for both of these, you lay your yarn on and you look for where the twist follows the line. Um, and for ply, it's easier to see for plying. So this is spot on for 30 degrees. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. So um, my... And it's 25 on this one, which leads me to say, make sure you use the same measuring tools throughout your entire project. Oh, that's weird. Um, yes. It's not weird. It happens all the time for me, at least. But if you compare those two, the angles on those two, are they different? Um, because that doesn't help when we're trying to put something in the magazine, like you want to make a yarn to these stats, but your mm -hmm. angle tool is different than my angle tool. Maybe one of them is, well, that wasn't my question. My question was this. Right. It's all a range. That's what <laughs> I, that's what I always say. It's all a range. Um, my question is, I feel like, I guess this is not a question so much as an assertion. Um, I assert. That <laughs> you assert. Did you want to stand up? <laughs> that these angles, um, measurements, in order to be helpful to us, should be taken before the yarn is finished. Because if you're going to be, if you're spinning a yarn and you want to match that, mm -hmm. you're going to only be able to check that angle as you're spinning it, which is also before it's finished. And if you take a measurement after it's finished, mm -hmm. um, 
it, it really, that angle changes. And so sometimes um, I get yarns in the mail for a, for a project, but I only have the finished yarn. And so I have to take the stats from the finished yarn, which isn't as helpful for people trying to spin it. And the- Well, it can, it can be if you say that it's finished, as long as you say that it's the finished uh, twist angle, because they could check it before and after. I usually measure before and after. And yeah. freakishly, when I am in my measuring groove, I will do a plyback sample or a small bit of plied yarn and finish it, even if I just like dunk it in hot water and then check the twist angle before and after. It's like, I don't even know you. I know. It's like, who are you? <laughs> no, but- That's true. <laughs> Hide. But um, no, that's a good idea. Like a small sample, because I find that spinners, like we're not gonna go through generally the whole process and then be like, oh, but this finished yarn doesn't measure that finished yarn. So I'm gonna start the whole thing over. Yep. Um, which is why I often ask, I, I always ask spinners that are spinning for a project to take those stats before they finish it. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking that it also adds an element of uh, unknowableness to trying to match a commercial yarn with twist angle because those yarns have not only been finished but set at a higher temperature than we can set them necessarily at home. Right, and usually under tension. Right, and so that, also makes it hard to recreate. So generally my question turned assertion is we're all much better spinners than we think because we're trying to spin to the wrong measurements. In that we're trying to finish, we're trying to spin our unfinished yarn to the measurement of a finished, finished measurement. Um, when we try to match a commercially spun yarn. So didn't that make you guys- That's why you should sample. Again, you're a stranger to me. <laughs> no. Oh, did you want to know that I check my grist in the middle of bobbins too? <laughs> um, That's okay. the secret side, the secret nerdy side of me. But those, yeah. these twist angle gauges and uh, yarn gauges are from hip strings. Somebody asked that. Um, they, uh, they have a lot of cool tools and um, fantastic fiber. And they're good people. Such nice people. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted your, but was that, was that the end of your? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, measuring it. I, oh, I wanted to say you that check your wrist in the middle of a bobbin are also people, the person who wrote the, the <laughs> consistency is personal <laughs> article. It is, but I know myself and I know that's where I make mistakes in the grist where I zone out and then I over... I over twist and the wraps per inch are the same, but my yarn weighs twice as much. So. I did not understand grist for the longest time. Um, like for the longest time as a spinner, I also didn't understand the difference between woolen and worsted for the longest time. Like I can remember literally saying to people, if someone would just be able to write, if someone would just write down an explanation that made sense. <laughs> Um, I could this say something rude, but I won't. Um, and spinning it no, it's, it's, it's part of something that I rail against a lot, especially when I've had a lot of caffeine, is that uh, a lot of teachers and spinners that have gone before us try to make it into this complex secret club. I mean, and, and, and I think the explanations of grist and sometimes woolen and worsted are much more complicated than they need to be. Yeah, May, I feel like what would have helped me at the time was not living in a bubble, not living outside of knowing any other hand spinners. And so I was basing, I was trying to create something I didn't know how to read about very well and then feel them to see the difference, but I wasn't actually creating the yarns I thought I was. And so the differences between wool and worsted didn't make sense because I wasn't able to create them. Um, I think it's easier when you, well, it's always easier when you have mentors or people, even not mentors, even people that are spinners that you see in person that you guys can learn and teach and, and compare because I, I just didn't have that the first several years. 
Well, and, that you feel comfortable asking questions too. That's a, a big part of it. I mean, I know you do, and I sometimes get people that come up to me, um, no matter how open I am in class, there are still people that are embarrassed to ask certain questions yes. that will come up afterwards where, where they just still don't understand or something. And just having somebody that you feel comfortable saying, I don't get, I still don't get it. Can you tell me in a different way or show me in a different way? Even when they say, when someone says that and they feel weird and are awkward, it's, there's honestly probably five more people in the room that feel oh, yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons when I was teaching, I stopped saying, does everyone understand that? Yeah. <laughs> or I stopped saying, does anyone have, have trouble with this thing? Um, and no one would say yes, but lots of people did because they were, they felt like it wasn't something like joins weren't something that a spinner should have trouble with, but half the spinners I know, including myself, depending on like the fiber type have trouble with different kinds of joins. And so uh, yeah, it's, it's that same thing that we all learn in such disparate ways. Nowadays, we're learning from so many different people and different sources that we all have these big gaps in our knowledge base. Oh my gosh. Did you hear that? Yes. It was like grace, baby. <laughs> it's like, I knew what I was talking about again. You do, you know, it all, <laughs> you know, it all. All right. You want to talk about heads and hands? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we have the next issue coming out is heads and hands, head and hand, I think is what we decided. We okay. haven't put the title on, but because we only have one head, we thought heads was weird. Okay. Head I was thinking of it as a collective. What was I originally? And then I think we had a discussion. Maybe you guys can weigh in on that. Head and hands, heads and hands, head and hand. Head <laughs> and hands. They just want to hear about the issue. <laughs> okay, so essentially the issue which comes out in winter is all about things you put on your head and all about things you put on your hands. And um, it was really fun. I, uh, I flew back, um, my middle child and me uh, flew back to Kansas City to shoot it with Bernadette. And again, still in COVID, so we had limited models. Once again, one of my children. <laughs> Um, and uh, some friends I had, um, actually, I'll show you when we get there. Uh, someone that actually works for the magazine, which is kind of cool. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little sneak peek as soon as I get to the part where that happens. Share screen. Um, desktop, let's see how that works. <laughs> I'm getting there, guys. <laughs> okay. It's loading. Oh yeah, okay, sneak peek. Look at that. Sneak peek. There's a bunch of stuff that goes on your hands. Um, we call this picture hand stack. <laughs> uh, these gloves at the top here, amazing. Actually, all of them are great, but these gloves right now, um, the magazine is just in layout and we've got to figure out how to decrease the fact that the pattern for those gloves is 12 pages long. The one on the top right? Uh, one on the top left. It's actually cables and bobbles and it's be they're beautiful. But Karen is on top of decreasing that, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, then there's a hat stack. And these are all wonderful hats. Uh, actually, right there, Maggie, that's your hat. See it right there. Oh, Maggie, that hat is so gorgeous. And I recognized it. Wait, who said what? Someone said something. Maggie recognized her hat. Yes, your hat. Uh, and then, oh, this was just a behind the scenes of the hat wearing fiber carding party that we had. Um, so this, this is really fun for me because I got to see friends that I haven't seen in a while. This is my friend, Christy, which if you've been to Plyaway, you know Christy. And that's me, that's my middle child and Bernadette's daughter. And we're all taking pictures and wearing hats. And it was a hundred degrees, FYI. Uh, this is one of the carding articles that we are working on with um, Emily and it's beautiful and you're gonna love it. And it's all about these rainbow bats that you then diz into roving and I don't know, it's beautiful. And the photos are beautiful. 
And this is an adorable couple uh, wearing a hat that was, the interesting thing about this hat is that it's exact same pattern, but Stephanie spun the lower one uh, woolen and the upper one worsted and it's the really different. But what I wanted to show you is this guy right here is the, um, our shipping department. That's our whole shipping department right there. That's Lee. <laughs> you yeah. Lee. That's, that's Lee. Um, and this is uh, Lee's partner. And is that everything? I think that might be all the stuff I've, oh, no, don't look at that. Okay, stopping sharing now. So that's my peek, which uh, it's it's not been laid out completely yet. So it's kind of just a few things here and there, but it's gonna be a great issue. Um, I'm really, I'm really happy with the issue so far. <laughs> well, and it's it's unusual for us because it's so pattern heavy. It is very pattern heavy. In fact, we're- There are so, so many cool things to make. Because when I flipped through like the first draft of it, I was like, oh, this one. No, wait, this one, which one? See, in the first draft, we had like, we separated it into all hats first and all hands, like into two halves of a magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really fun. I, uh, I, we had to take a picture of each thing. So I don't know. It's, we always like the ability to kind of switch layout up when we have these kind of different themes and this is one that required kind of a different layout, which I really enjoy. Um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, I'm also kind of out of head. Like by the time we do a sneak preview of an issue, I'm already like a month and a half into the next issue and I haven't worked on that issue for a while. So, uh, so you know, I'm already into goat. Ask me about goat. Goats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking about ply away. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys a little, uh, a little, a little truth time here in that I have not, Jillian has been asking me to in her gentle way. Um, and I have not been able to wrap my head around ply away. It's always been like, I'm under contract already. We are going to do it, but because it's, I don't know, it's just been a hard year. And because there's so much that goes into it and vaccines and just COVID in general. And like, it's just, I just haven't been able to get myself together. Um, until this last week when Jillian was like, you got to do it. And so, um, yeah, so now we did it. And there's been some teacher reshuffling for several reasons. Um, because when we booked this whole thing originally, it was 2020. And so teachers have to, at this point, it's been so long since we've taught that we have to kind of take teaching gigs as they come up. And so there's some teaching conflict times with some teachers. There's some teachers that are unable to get vaccinated. Um, there's some people that don't feel safe health-wise traveling. Um, so there's just a bunch of stuff that I wasn't totally prepared to deal with. And so there has been some teacher reshuffling. Um, the teachers will be up tomorrow, the final list of teachers, which Maggie, you're on that, right? <laughs> just <laughs> love that. <laughs> um, Final list of teachers, which for the first time in years, I am in that list. Uh, I promise to try to learn to speak better about spending <laughs> before then. Um, and so teachers up tomorrow, classes up on the 20th, uh, the 30th. Well, real registration starts on the 31st, Halloween. Um, but we thought it might be nice for everyone that was registered for 2020 um, that we then had to refund and not do, that we give them one day early registration. So everyone that was registered before that was intending on coming um, will get an email link to an early registration so they can make sure if they wanna come this year, make sure and get in. Um, and then regular registration opens up the 31st. That's my spiel. Yay. That's the truth bomb. Just dropped. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
it's hard. It's hard to think about doing a big, uh, an, a big event. Even though things are getting better, things are safer, there's still a lot of worry. I mean, Maggie just taught at SOAR and it went great. But, it did. But I'm sure everyone that was putting on SOAR fretted up until the day everybody was there and relaxed and spinning. And it was very small too. Yeah. But yeah. It, was, it was magical just to be in person again. Yeah. Uh, even with masks. And that worked okay. The teaching with masks was. Boulder has a mask mandate. So yeah. Um, I, however, taught on a screened porch. Oh, nice. So, so you didn't have to have masks. My class was the only unmasked class. <laughs> you stamp, Maggie. You, you arranged that, didn't you? Well, actually, Anne gave me this little tiny classroom. That was, I mean, because she was looking from photos. Gotcha. And when she, and when she got there and she saw how tiny it was, it just wasn't going to work. So then it was either a little tiny inside place or a screen porch. So if the weather turned bad, <laughs> it could have been awful, but it wasn't. It was lovely. Nice. Yeah, because spinners make everything magic. It, well, it was. By the force it, of our will. Yes, <laughs> Um, so I, and PLA or SOAR had a full a vaccination requirement, right? They did. Yes. As far as I can tell, most of the of places holding classes are having the same thing. And I have had a, a little bit, a couple negative responses to that. And I mostly just want to say that, like, it is not our intention at all to exclude anybody um, and I know there are people that not only don't want to get vaccinated, but people that like physically health wise can't. Um, and I feel for that. It's just that right now with the information we have and with the venue and the mandates in different areas, like we just, we just have to do it. And I, I honestly considered, and I would be willing to entertain some discussion on this, but, um, I was considering because I went to an event that was either fully vaccinated or you had to have a negative COVID test within three days, but the event I went to, no one was traveling for. Mm -hmm. And so it was all in one town and you got a negative, like it wouldn't really work to have someone get a negative test and then fly yeah. on a plane. And then it just feels, but <laughs> conversely, um, what was I going to say? I lost that train of thought. Well, we would also have to keep track of every one of those things oh, as right. opposed to keeping track of making fly away. Wonderful. The other thing, the reason that, and we are going to have to deal with this a little bit anyway, but it really introduces a difficulty in, um, if we left it like, okay, you have to have a negative test within three days, there is the possibility then within our rules that we would have to give a refund to those people within mm -hmm. three days and we couldn't fill their spot in three days. Whereas right now, you know, you have a refund, whatever, six weeks out, we have a chance to fill the spot. And so there's the possibility of, of ending up with much lower attendance rate at the last minute, which, I mean, ply away right now, it's, it's a show we kind of, we strive to break even. And um, so it's just, it's so complicated. And I'm letting you guys in on a little bit of why I haven't wanted to think about it or do it. Um, like actually do the work to get it organized uh, because it's a lot, it's a lot to think about. And in the end, I'm gonna be disappointing some number of people. And that's always hard for me because I'm a pleaser. Yes. Well, and maybe uh, mask mandates will change by then too. Um, and we'll see. I mean, it's, it's many months away. Okay. But, okay. Good. I wanted to say one more thing. Let's see. Let me make the sharing talking about getting people involved is that I hope you all know that we are always looking for people to write for us. 
to okay. write for us, to spin for us, to design for us. There's a whole section on the website about all of those things. And there are beautiful mood boards that talk about issues that are coming up and places to uh, put your ideas for, um, for articles or patterns. And we're just always looking for new people. We want new voices. We want interesting things. And even if you have an idea that you don't particularly want or feel qualified to write about, um, give it to us. We can always find people. If it is a fantastic idea, we can find people to uh, knit and spin. And we're looking for people at all levels. Please don't feel like you have to be an expert. Um, I know that I I don't feel like an expert. <laughs> I would never call myself an expert. Uh, so if I felt like I had to be an expert to be in the magazine, I would never ever write for the magazine or anything else. <laughs> uh, but we're looking for everybody. Yeah, and we, if you have an idea that's not all the way fleshed out, um, and uh, one of my favorite, you probably know this if you have looked through any of the issues of the magazine, one of my favorite types of articles are experimental articles, which essentially mean you just have a question. You don't know the answer until after you do it. Laura's like, yes. 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 But that's the most, to me, the most fascinating because I often have the same question. and. Right. Watch someone or to have someone go through the sequence and figure out the answer instead of instead of just uh, guessing or or, or presenting it as a done deal. You also get to see someone's process. So, I mean, when I read because oh, I love to experiment too, and I read experimental articles, I'm like, well, there's this piece that I don't agree with, so I'm going to spin my own yarn going in a different direction from this this branch of the idea. Yes. But yeah, I think it, it involves, and um, I know it excites, the experimental articles always excite my brain more. Yeah. Um, we also, I will be sending out an email, hopefully today, uh, about, because we're just kind of settling the loft issue, and I'll be sending out an email because we're looking for like a couple fiber dyers, someone, a, a carter to prep some fiber, uh, a couple different fiber sources and a spinner. So be on the lookout for that if you are indeed on our uh, contributor mailing list. And if you're not, you know, hop there. And <laughs> cause that's the email that's coming out. There's a um, lot coming out this week. That, Plyway. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, okay. That's all I got. Great. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Can I just say, as someone who's recently started working for Apply, like is writing articles, it's such a fun time. And Karen's so awesome to work with. So Karen! She will Karen. definitely like, help you out. Any questions you have, even if they're silly questions, you think they're silly questions, she'll answer for you. So it's if you want to get started writing, apply away is apply is a great way to start. For sure. And if you're not great on time, Karen is the best. <laughs> she will send you reminder emails. She is a gentle whip. You have ten weeks until this is done. Two weeks. <laughs> two weeks. The, your article is due. Those are my favorite. <laughs> Which actually, in my opinion, is when most people get that two week email, they're like, "Oh yeah, I better start that article." <laughs> <laughs> that is the secret <laughs> procrastinators all except for james <laughs> yes that's true okay great uh, any well, other any questions comments and anything nothing. thanks so much everybody smiling I yay don't, i don't see any major questions okay oh. all right thank you so much for coming along Yes, you guys have a nice rest of your weekend and, uh, you know, see you on the flip side. <laughs>